You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. And welcome Ooh. to the second part of our discussion on Sujata Massey's The Bombay Prince, the third novel in the Purveen Mystery series. We are discussing chapters 13 to 26 today. Herds is in the hot seat. Mm. And uh, we continue our investigation of the death into Frenny Cutting Master at the parade for the Prince of Wales and his arrival in Bombay. Well, we actually almost get to meet the prince this time around, which I thought was we very exciting. We get close. We get close. We get to go to a, a party, but unfortunately our, our main characters are unceremoniously thrown out before they oh, they get goodness. the chance, which is a great scene. Yeah. Well, I, I did want to I did want to open with a little bit kind of related to that. Oh, really? Was there you go. that in the last stretch of chapters, Uh-oh. we kind of had like two main events, right? <laughs> okay. We had the parade and we had them at the hotel. Oh my goodness. Yep. Mm-hmm. But in this stretch of chapters, we have There's a lot more. A court case. We have a visit to the family. We have meeting with the rest of Perveen's family. We have a run in with the school teachers. Mm-hmm. We have a late night you know, rendezvous with Colin, who's warning that oh Perveen might be framed by the guy keeping the prince safe. We <laughs> and then we get to this party towards the end where the prince is there. And everyone's there. It's great. Everyone's there. And the mysteries both get kicked out because apparently it's unsafe. All these policemen have it out for Perveen and her meddling in their affairs to the point that, you know, they've been warned by Colin that, you know, maybe you might be under a little bit of suspicion. Yeah, yeah. And, and Perveen's father says, you know, well, those are the people at the party that we need to talk to and put on smiling faces for to make sure they don't suspect us. Unfortunately, two of the people already in that circle hate Perveen's guts. Yeah. So it, it, it actually, instead of being an opportunity to show how innocent she is, it's a perfect opportunity for them to interrogate her, grill her, and publicly shame her in front of all the people that might convict her later. It's also so great when they get kicked out and JP Singer's out there <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, you guys got kicked out as well. Jay, what a nerd. I love him so he's much. So he's so good. Can I tell you, in real life, okay, it, I do have a life outside of this this studio. I don't believe there it. is a uh, a cafe that I sometimes get lunch at, and there is the, the owner of that cafe there. He's always trying to like sweet talk me and like chat with me about how work's <laughs> going, and he's like, I respect his hustle, and I, <laughs> but I hate the guy, and that's how I feel about Jay. What? I love like. <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> like Michael. I love his hustle. I love him as a character, but I don't think I could stay in the same room. This is, this is just a really roundabout way of saying you don't like my standard operating procedure, Herds. I mean, I wasn't going to say it on on air like this, <laughs> but no, nah, I, I love Jay as a character. I think he does such a good job of fitting in with the overall narrative and like chatting about media ethics and like the global stage and how we view India and the fact that he gets. Everywhere, even though he's clearly painted as this like slightly obnoxious, overzealous journalist, it's great. His <laughs> just complete blindness to that fact, where he's like, "Well, well, yeah, we were expected to sit down the back of the party and just write down the pretty taglines for the press, but I decided I want to comment directly from the prince <laughs> on what he thought of the Indian resistance." The, I, I would argue it's less <laughs> blindness and more awareness that he's not going to get anywhere if he follows the rules. Yeah, which. Yeah. You know, might just be plain stupid and liable to get him, you know, executed or arrested. But, eh, you know, you got to admire his moxie. I think the other scene that's really good that follows on from this is when we speak down with your lead suspect, Herds. Oh, yes. Terrence Grady. Oh, my goodness. Grady. In his office. And with uh, Alice Hobson Jones in in the wings supporting Pervine Mystery, we kind of find out what happened on the morning of Frenny's death and yeah. where Frenny was before uh, she died. Yeah. And it's it's not shaping up well for Terrence <laughs> Grady, even if he isn't the culprit. Well, he's he's such an interesting character to me, and I think this is why I, why I gravitated to him last week. I wanted to see more of him because he is an activist, but he can't quite bring himself to put his neck on the line in the same way that Frenny wanted to and that Paveen does in every chapter of this novel. (laughs) And I think that's the big separation there, right? It's also like the biggest thing to point out, like why he doesn't really suit being the culprit because Dinesh and his action is so antithetical to the kind of backseaty way that he does his activism. Yeah, he's, he's 
like I don't want to say spineless, but like that's the direction his character is in. He doesn't he doesn't have the the uh, overconfidence or dare I say the psychopathy to commit murder. Um, <laughs> yeah, he like he believes in the education system making change in the long term. Yes, as yes. like an excuse for doing nothing in the short term. You know, not to speak to the efficacy of that opinion, but that's his at least. <laughs> that's that's his job. <laughs> but there's there's a chapter that's even before that one where. I think the culprit has more or less revealed themselves, but we'll-, we'll Oh, really? Thing, Interesting. I, I think so. But um, the other scene that I did want to talk about while we're- The court, the court, the court. I mean, obviously it's the court scene, yes. which is the best scene in the novel so because good. we really bring uh, Pervine's role as a lawyer to to task, to be tested, right? Because mm. it's, not, it's not a trial to like catch the criminal. It's the coroner's inquest into the death of Frenny. And through the course of this scene, we do a couple of things. We, we test- uh, Perveen's skill as a lawyer. We also overturn quite a few traditional like detective fiction tropes. A letter is found that has never been mentioned. It comes out of nowhere that says, I, Frenny, am a terrorist. Pretty much. And I killed myself because I hate Britain. But like the words are spelled wrong and it doesn't sound like her at all. And it is on a typewriter, but we don't even know if it's the same typewriter. Yeah, that- it has her like fingerprint in typewriter ink on there, but it's very it's, obviously it's pointed out that that means nothing. The success of this scene, I suppose, the success of Perveen in successfully pushing things towards it being uh, ruled as homicide causes more problems for her. And I think that's that's the core of why I enjoy Perveen in this novel so much because all the, all the problems she has come from her success, right? Yeah, I also think it's such a good way to use a lawyer in a crime story. I'm thinking particularly of uh, Aoife Clifford's When We Fall, which you might've heard me talk about on ABC's The Bookshelf. And we'll also have Aoife on the show here on Death of the Reader. So get subscribed or make sure you're tuning in each week so you don't miss that. Now, don't get me wrong, because I do love When We Fall Mm. and I love her lead character, Alex, who is a lawyer, (laughs) but she doesn't practice law in that. She practices vigilante detectivism. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's (laughs) what I was worried about in this one. Yeah, yeah, Pervine, like, is a lawyer in this story and does a great job of showing it. And there's always this, like, resistance that she feels in that if I do anything wrong here, it ruins it for like decades, right? Can I tell you that the best possible sequence of events is she calls the mother up to the stand, essentially. Like it's it's not as simple as that, but that's what ends up happening. The mother is called to the stand to protest that, you know, her daughter could never have committed suicide. And in the end, it seems like it helps the case be ruled as a, as a homicide rather than a suicide. But after the case, the father comes in and says, you have- ruined everything we're yes. gonna be slandered for this they like they meet outside the court and Perveen is like well it's been ruled a homicide now so the Which police is are gonna ask you these questions yes and the father goes are you goes accusing off. me of murder and she's like no but they might absolutely not yeah she's like i'm not but they might and you need to be prepared for that and then the dad comes in and says you're doing all the right things Perveen. you're doing great Perveen's father is such an excellent character too he's like <laughs> he's he's not passive no not at all like he he's a very active character but he also kind of has no effect on the plot in in this beautiful way where he's constantly making things happen but it's always like entertainment factor things <laughs> rather than forward progression of the story i mean he's there to support his daughter right like that's that's yeah. his purpose as a character i mean the cherry on top we need to stop talking about it, but the cherry on top is when they get kicked out of the club and again, in another novel, he might say, Perveen, look at the mess that you've gotten this into. My goodness, you're a disappointment <laughs> as a daughter. But instead, he's just so furious. He's like, again, we did all the right things. It's a shame. I love you, my daughter. Let's just stay away from this club for a while. Oh, man. It's great. We should wrap this here, though, Herds, and come back and talk about your latest iteration of solution Good. for this novel. We're going to learn about how it was... The little girl, the little Frenny's friend girl that did it the whole time, Miss Uh Akraya, whatever her name was. Lolita. Lolita, that's the one. Reference to a famous other novel, which- Which we will not discuss. Will not discuss. Yeah, shout out. (laughs) (laughs) Terrible. That's that's a- that's a- Terrible joke. Look, you made it, not me. I'm getting, I'm getting out. I'm out of here. I'm done. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are discussing The Bombay Prince by Sajada Massey, chapters 13 to 26. And we'll be back with more of that in just a second. Mm-hmm. 
You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex here with you, and I am joined today by journalist and travel writer Sina Desai Gopal. Her debut novel, The 86th Village, is out on the 12th of April this year, and I was given the opportunity to read through it early. Sina, it is wonderful to have you here on Death of the Reader. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So you've got a strong personal connection to the premise of this and the 86 villages set to be flooded by the development of a dam. Could you tell me a little bit about the developments that are happening where your family comes from and how they spurred on the novel? Yeah, so the dam is nothing new. It was sanctioned in like 1964 uh, by the Indian government with some funds from the World Bank, but they really didn't get around to building it until like maybe two decades ago, like 2002, I think. Um, It was just the corruption, uh, inefficiency, no plan. So basically an entire generation lived in this area, knowing that they would flood, but not when it would happen. So I started with journalizing it, but it's impossible to do that if you are so invested. So I took all my research and I turned it into fiction. The 86 Village has um, corruption at every level. It's personal corruption. It's political corruption. It is like international corruption. But the po- the whole point of the book actually is that most of these people are aware of what they're doing. Yeah, I really like the way that Samar as a character is used in that sense because he's arguably in some ways one of the more innocent a- adults in the story that we get to see a feature of. Right. But th- the premise of him being st- there is still that sense of guilt where he was working for the government, realized how horrible what the government was doing was and is now trying to like yeah. push back at the other way but can't quite because he's like being threatened do you think that there are people out there with that sense of altruism who are pushing back that we don't hear about as often in these stories of you know small villages being forgotten by the system oh yeah absolutely if you talk about dams right they are obsolete right now that that's something they thought you know people thought and scientists thought it was a great thing in the 1950s but they're obsolete you know environmentalists and scientists realized that these were not a good idea because they, besides everything else, they also changed the climate of these places. And that is also the other thing that's there in the 86 village. It's not just the dam, but also the climate change that happens. But no one wants to take responsibility for it because it's largely controlled by the government and corporations. So there's no room for compensation. Yeah, I I think there was there was also something really fascinating about the kind of pace of the book that you put in here on that front because so much of those changes and like, you know, the sense of climate changing around you can be so slow that some people just don't even notice it. Is there a bit of a challenge to you there in trying to keep the momentum of the story up while still showing how slow and intricate all of these different points that corruption was able to take foothold were? No, because uh, they do happen over a long stretch of time. And uh, yeah, I I don't think that was a problem at all because when you research it, I literally researched it like five years. So in these five years, this is what happened. In the next five years, this is what happened. So it's never, in, you don't see it most of the time in one or two years. You see it in increments of like five years, sometimes decades. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was really good. I thought the way that like, you know, compared to, because it was, it was, pitched to me by uh, your publishers over at Agora Books as being a thriller. And when I think of thriller, I think action yeah. sequences. I think fast moving, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> guns blazing. But no. it, it's a very different style of thriller. I was thinking uh, along the lines of like Tim Aliff's The Enemy Within, but even then that's a bit more action driven where it really takes its time to think on the issues and the thrill comes out of the like almost the horror at what people can do to one another. So how did you feel about that? Were you just like waiting? I loved it. Okay, good. (laughs) There is this beautiful point in chapter 11 Mm -hmm. where, and this is something you do throughout the book that I really love. You kind of restate the initial description uh, of the village that you gave at the start of the book. And it was so good because you get to that point where you restate things and you've seen so much of the village and suddenly this description you gave at the start like means something different. You know, when you're talking about political corruption, there is every I think anything with that can be a crime novel, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> So, uh, and that's exactly what happened when I was writing the book, because I just used the backdrop uh, of what was happening in this area with like 86 villages to tell another story, uh, which reflected personal crime. 
the main character in this book is not a person, it's the village. Yes, absolutely. It's not people because the people make the village and the village makes the people. I, I did find it interesting that we set up this novel with uh, Reshma arriving in the village and becoming part of uh, the, the Nayak family at their at their home. Uh, but then also there's this sense of powerlessness that the kids have where despite being so important to it, they can't really do anything about it in the same way that the villagers can't really do anything about anything without Raj being there right. because they need someone right. with power to right. tackle the corruption. It, you know, right. that's that's kind of a, a bit of a crux of the issue there. Why was opening the story with the children when they didn't really have the power to change anything so important to that narrative of corruption? Oh, why was it important to have those children? Because also they signify the powerlessness of the whole system. And they needed someone in power to help them get along and, and you know, move along in life. They're like completely helpless. All three kids, like Parthi, Reshma, Guru, but they have a few people behind them who are going to help, especially Raj's wife, Daya. That is what happens to a lot of children in India in these kind of projects. Yeah, there, there's a note there, I guess, about the farmers being educated where like bringing cell phones and modern communication into the village was like uh, an avenue for people to understand what their rights even should be. Uh, I, I guess is communication like a big factor for communities like that in understanding like their place in the world? I can tell you a couple of experiences that I've had. Uh, so like even 10 years ago, uh, the farmers and like the poor people in villages, they did not have access to a lot of information. But then cell phones came along and access to the world. So they started realizing that something as simple as if they had to sell like the sugarcane crop to a factory, uh, they were not, they knew what was, what the price was because they could go online and find it. So it helped them in that way. They may be illiterate, but they can get on the phone and figure out some things. And that really changed the landscape of India in general, because then suddenly these people have access and no one is controlling it. Before that, it was the politicians and the elite and the educated who were controlling what this huge population was doing. I, I, I think I think it's really cool as well there, because we have like the, the kind of two sides of the village, the like very big corruption of Santosh and Vera and their... Uh, let's just use the word infidelity to try and keep it as yeah. few words as possible compared to the, the the very functional relationships in many senses of Samara and Usha and Raj and Daya. And I, I thought that contrast was both really well used as a storytelling tool, but also like very blunt. The idea that our corrupt politicians would also just have no functional marriages and no way of sticking their lives together. Is that kind of something you did for dramatic effect? Or do you think that there's something real to the idea that people who are corrupt can't, you know, deal with people on any level? No. Oh my God. That's so realistic. I, I you know, I grew up uh, in a very political family and of course we were the good guys, but oh yeah. I mean, I think the two are not mutually exclusive at all. So growing up, I saw like this new hybrid of politicians in India as that India progressed into becoming more and more independent. But there were also this crop of uh, politicians and government officials who had like every aspect of their lives was corrupt. Yeah, I, I guess the thing that I wanted to kind of wrap up with is you mentioned earlier that you didn't originally set out to write a crime novel. Uh, but it kind of just happened because the story came about. I guess now having gotten to the point, the book is just about to come out and I'm sure you're kind of getting into the press circuit and speaking to people about the book like uh, us here on Death of the Reader. Do you feel like you have stepped a foot into the crime fiction community or, you know, is is it just kind of incidental? Do you see this book as crime fiction now that you've kind of gotten to its near release? I do, because I've thought about this, and I think there is no way you can write about political corruption in India and think it's not crime. Let's put it that way. It is crime, and it may not be like one guy going there and shooting someone, but it's crime of a different kind. You're still like killing people. You're killing people not in huge numbers, and this has happened in so many places in the last like 50, 60 years. So yeah, I think it's crime fiction and I didn't intend it as crime fiction, but I didn't think it would be any fiction for that matter. I had a story in me and I told it. Yeah. Well, 
Sena, welcome to the crime fiction community. It is a delight to have <laughs> you, and especially with a book that was this engrossing to read, you know. I was absolutely hooked, and it's so good to have uh, new voices in the community like yourself telling these stories. Wait, thank you so much for having me. We will have links up on the podcast, and thank you to Agora Books for getting us in touch with Sena because it's been great fun reading through this novel. If you want to check it out, it will be out on the 12th of April this year. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We'll be back with more in just a second. Stick around. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. It is our second week discussing Sujata Massey's The Bombay Prince. This week is chapters 13 to 26. Herds is the one roping in a solution from the depths of Back Bay. I I can only hope that I've gone far enough into this novel. This is the worry that I have whenever I I step up to the to the stand and I go, this is my theory. I sure hope that I haven't missed anything incredibly important because the theory that I have for this novel is is not terribly complicated. Good. And I wonder if maybe that's why I didn't really have a super strong theory for last week because I was looking for yeah, something that yeah. was a little bit higher up. Because let, let me tell you, um, reading this novel and, and going back over the way that the characters talk, because this is a very character-focused novel, I, I've gone over the teachers, I've gone over the, the principal and Mr. Grady and Alice Hobson-Jones and Freddie's father, who Paveen suspects at some point. But there is only one character who talks like a psychopath. Uh, and that's that's Naval. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, I'm not even sure I follow this train of thought right now. This is uh, Naval Hotelwala, I, Hotel I believe, yeah, yeah. the student photographer. Mm-hmm. There is a sequence where they're hanging out with Naval and and is it Kushru? Yeah, Kushru and Alice Hobson Jones, Vivian, and they're all they're doing this whole song and dance and talking about how f- fun school is and how silly dogs are and stuff. Uh, Alice says, oh gosh, it's just been so much trouble at home with Diana, who was a new dog that we met a couple of chapters previously. Mm. And both of the boys look at Alice and they're like, excuse me, miss. Yeah. And she's like, oh, it's all right. It's just my dog. <laughs> but the gag of course is, is that the beginning yep. of the first book in the series was that Alice was kicked out of school because she was found in bed yeah. with another woman. I, I need to <laughs> let you know, I, I haven't read the previous novels, but I, yeah. I figure that out. There's a line where they're, they're talking about setting Alice up with a with a man, with Colin maybe. Yeah. And Paveen says something to the tune of, Colin. I don't think that any kind of man could pull her away from her work. She's also, she's so well written as a character who is like simultaneously very competent, but also not confident in her competence. I like that she is... She she is self driven, if not selfish. Yes. So let me let me tell you. One of the big themes in this story is about uh, jealousy and, and envy, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there are several characters, Koresh and Lalita, who we've mentioned previously, uh, both are very jealous of Frenny or were jealous because they were both passed by by well, in their studies. Did they? Because there's a comment that Lolita yeah. and Frenny were kind of like trading places back and forth. Like they were yeah, they were rivals, not no, really. Oh, sh- you shush your mouth. There's a, there's a line which is like, it's Paveen having an inner lo- monologue moment where she says, ah, there it is, the hidden jealousy. <laughs> and this, this ties in with Naval, who is very forthright, very forceful in the way that he speaks especially to adults. Uh, also, Alice mentions that whenever Naval like, loses marks on a test, he gets really upset. And it's it's because he's a psychopath. He doesn't like being told that he's inferior to anybody else. And I'm saying this because I went to school with someone like this. Are you accusing your former classmate of murder right now? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if they ever committed murder, but they did. They they have been known to fits of violence, is all I will say. This is really just heard vents on people Look, in his life in the episode. To. And at no least names. two of those people are me. It's true. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. I don't think that Flex has ever bodily harmed me in any significant way. At least not in a way that wasn't for a bit. So I think that Naval is the person who's actually done the murder. I think it was done, obviously it was done during the prince's parade. I think that what happened essentially is that Naval has pressured Kushru and Dinesh to be part of his like plan to steal the school's money. Um, oh my God. And you cause a big distraction and I'll give you some of the money when you get out. Maybe I'll pay for your bail. Yeah. Uh, and Kushru, you're, you're already screwed anyway. You're a lying, murdering boy who killed Frenny's brother, et cetera, et cetera. What? I'm going to pressure- I'm going to pressure you into working what? with me. 
What? And then let me finish my thought before oh you start. Sh- gosh, these accusations. Look, I, I'm a regular Columbo. I don't know. Uh, point is that the, the plan was for Naval to send Chris Shrew to steal the money and Dinesh to cause a distraction. And then Frenny just so happened to be kind of around at the time. She saw what was going on. Yeah. She has a big deal with telling the truth. And so Naval said, well, I don't like her anyway. I'm very envious of her. And so I'm going to take great pleasure in strangling her. And the reason why strangling is important is because Mr. Grady almost threatens to strangle uh, Alice when they are in a hot-blooded situation. Mm. So I think that the murder is in fact a crime of, of, of hot blood. It is not a planned killing of Frenny. I think that it happened- Hold on. You know, while the stealing of the money oh was occurring. Oh my God. Okay, this is all so complicated. I I'm mean, sorry. first of all, I just want to be clear, if for whatever reason you aren't reading the book along with us, at no point did Akushru and Naval ever established as being at the scene of the crime no, of Darius' not. death. It is, is Darius Naval and some other kid- yeah, look, I, I don't know about that. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it's a fascinating pitch to make. Like, I, I do like that there are parallels between the two crimes here, right? Sure. That, you know, because he uh, Darius was out, like, playing sport. They were hanging out. They were playing kickball, and then they decided to get a drink from a well that was... Mm, you know, and he, like, fell in or whatever, which just, you, you know, is immediately suspicious if you're reading a murder it mystery is. novel. The, it, the, the book explicitly states that they waited too long to get help. What I can tell you is that Kushu is obviously being pressured by Naval. Whether that is because Kushu literally killed Darius or because he just feels responsible for it, Either way, that is the piece of like emotional blackmail that Naval is leaning on. Okay, so that's that's why you're making the stretch towards Darius's death is because you think that might be the piece of blackmail. Yes. Okay, because he, I mean, Kushner right. repeatedly says like, "I am already guilty. I have no life. Yeah, yeah. I have no future." Like clearly, this is Naval filling his head with like, "You're worth nothing. You might as well do what I say because because I know what's best. I'm the smart one." You know that sort of nonsense. Kushner is the thug in this story, and I feel bad for him. I think Dinesh could have been, but we haven't seen him in a while. So yeah. Oh, also, oh, that reminds also, me. Okay, hold on. Please, quickly, before I ask more questions. Yeah, thank you. I meant to mention Alice Hobson Jones picked up a copy of the Wood Burnie, and I think that that's going to be the final piece of uh, of of evidence because Naval was supposed to be taking photos of the prints and he clearly wasn't. And so that's how we're going to nail him. We're going to point to the school newspaper and be like, there are no pictures of the prints during this time, Naval. Where were you? Off yeah. strangling Frenny? Mm-hmm. And that's how we're going to get him. You, you've covered the main details of the crime here okay, for me. Good. I did want to ask for you for your uh, fourth potential point here. Oh. JP Singer, <laughs> you, you reckon he's just going to be one of the like added many vaguely romantic interests that we have in the flavor of Colin in the line of this series, or what can we expect from him? Oh my goodness. I do. I do find it curious that Grady was supposedly, he had like worked for the Bombay Chronicle and there's obviously a way to like expose Jay there. Um, I also think that the way, like, cause when he said, you know, Oh, I also was kicked out of the party. Like, obviously that was not true. What? Hold on. What? You're telling me he didn't actually approach the prince and get carried out of the building to no, walk away on his no, own two feet? No, no, <laughs> no. He definitely wants to talk to Paveen. Um, yeah. Whether he's like just a gross guy who wants to get with Paveen or if he's trying to slander her, possibly in connection to the to the police department. Hold on. Are you suggesting that Mortimer might be working with JP to frame Paveen? You know what? I'm going to say yes, because oh I'm gosh. not sure where else- I'm not sure where else I can put a connection there. That that's that's where my brain right. is. I'm fascinated. I would by say this. that they are working together. Um, perhaps he's at. You know what? I'm going to say that he's actually a, a what we might call a plainclothes detective. Except he's a little bit better than uh, uh. the other one who we've already exposed in the story and who has said nothing of it, of, of interest. In fact, maybe they're the same character. Is that what it's going to be? Is it going to be the plainclothes detective and Jay are the same character? Let's go with that. That sounds like fun. Okay. I'm interested. I'm interested. Uh, Me too. I'm excited to see how the novel wraps up. Alrighty. Well, I mean, that's what we're going to be doing next week when we uh, dive all the way to the end of The Bombay Prince by Sajada Massey, chapters 27 to the end. Herds, best of luck. Thank you. Hopefully all has gone well for you. (laughs) We'll, we'll see. We'll see how we go. I'm hoping for two points. <laughs> <laughs> this is your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. We'll be back with that next week. See you then. 